God Tier is the new game by Steamforge Games, who are the same people that bought you Guild Ball and Dark Souls and Resident Evil 2. God Tier is a skirmish miniatures game set in a fantasy world where everything's ruined. Really, everything's gone to pot. The world's fallen in, skies have exploded, the land has cracked, and all the gods are dead. However, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, as our band of plucky adventurers go about their days trying to retrieve parts of the fallen gods that have fallen to earth so as to claim their power and ascend to godhood. These are called god tears, and not everyone can touch them, and if they try, they explode as if it was pure, concentrated evil. Don't touch it! Unlike other miniatures games, there is no army building or team selection. You don't have a warband to build or a crew to select. Actually, that's not true. You do have a warband to build, but not in the same way that we're used to. You don't have points. You don't have people that can't go with each other. You just take the champions that you like the look of or how they play and stick them together. There are massive dwarfs and orcs and humans with enormous swords, tiny little gnome dwarf ladies who control rocks. Did I mention the enormous dwarfs? For some reason there are elves. And also there are orcs. Why would you play elves? <coughs> Especially when there are dragons or the angry vegan god of justice. I assume that's what he is. Well, that's all very well and good, Beard, I hear you say, but what do I do now I've got these champions? Well, then you play the game, obviously. Come on. The game has a number of pieces which include the champions which when you choose them their followers come along for free and also their banners so that they can stick them in the ground and claim bits to be theirs. We as Englishmen very familiar with this concept of course. <laughs> With the game board between them and the models deployed and the objective hits is placed down depended on the scenario, each player then has five turns with which to win the game. Each turn is worth a different amount of points, starting at one for the first turn, two for the second, three for the third, and then back down again, two for the fourth, one for the fifth. First person to five points wins. Hooray! Points are scored throughout the turn and noted with the battle ladder at the side, starting on the side of the player that's going first. As you score points, you move the little marker towards you and away from your opponent, and at the end of the turn, whoever's side of the battle ladder the little token is on, they have won and get the aforementioned points. And what do points mean? Continuing to play until you have five. But how do I win these turns, I hear you say? Which is a perfectly reasonable question in a tutorial video. Well, you have your turn, which is divided into two separate distinct phases. The clash phase and the plot phase. The plot phase is the part where you make all your plans and decide what you're going to do for the turn. And as such, it's the bit that comes first, because plans that come afterwards are just called reacting to things. The first player goes first naturally, um, and they activate all of their models and enact all of the plans that they want to do. Then the other person gets a go. The clash phase, however, is when all of these plans come to fruition. Maybe. During which the first player will activate either a band of followers or their champion, then the next player will activate a band of followers or their champion, and alternate backwards and forwards until everyone's models have been done. But what can I do in these phases, I hear you say, like some kind of squawking needy little bird! Um, excuse me. There are a number of actions that both champions and followers can take, and oh look, they're on screen now. Uh, so you can advance, which I'll come to in just a moment, use a skill from your model's card, which I'll come to after that. Then there are some that are specific to both champions and followers. Champions can use their ultimate ability, a once per game massive boost. They can claim, but only in the plot phase, where they stick their flag in the ground and claim it as theirs. <laughs> They can rally, which is the primary way the majority of champions will clear any wounds. Lastly, the only follower exclusive action is Recruit, by which they gain more members to their cadre should any have been taken out. Spoiler alert, some will get taken out. A lot. Well, that all seems pretty straightforward, but how will I know which things I can do in which phase? Are there certain actions which can be done in the plot phase and, and in the clash phase and vice versa? The claim action would certainly insinuate that that's the case, and the answer is yes. Yes, it is. That That's true. So let's take a look at Nia's card, because it's handy and convenient, such as it is. So aside from the fact that it looks lovely and the artwork is popping and everything looks great, there's a very key icon on the right hand side that looks like a dagger stabbed into a map. This is what denotes the fact that we're in the plot phase, or rather this is the plot phase side of the card. So if that's not what you're seeing, you're looking at the clash phase side of the card, which has this little axe symbol that looks like this. 
Now, eagle-eyed, handy viewers such as you are may have noticed the fact that the background behind Nier is also white or black, depending on whether we're in the plot or the clash phase. This is just another handy little way of denoting which side of the card you are or should be looking at, which is nice. For right now, let's just put them next to each other so we can compare the two. Looking again at the list of actions that champions and followers can take, the first one is advance, so move the champion or each follower a number of hexes up to its speed. So presumably one of these things on the card is its speed. And it is, because that would make sense. So this little icon of a foot with the number one on it on the plot phase side of the card denotes Nia's speed in the plot phase. Similarly, this one over on the Clash card denotes her speed in the Clash phase. So it looks like Nia's speed is 1 in the plot phase, 2 in the Clash phase, denoting that she is twice as fast in the Clash phase, or the doing phase, than she is in the plot phase, or the thinking phase. Which makes perfect sense, she's far too busy coming up with plans, casting spells, and moving her minions around and giving them boons and stuff, than she is in the phase where you actually achieve things. That makes sense. Next on the list then, skills. So both an action that a champion and a follower can take in either the clash or the plot phase uses skill from the model's card. Right then, where are the skills? So skills take up the vast majority of the card and are this bit here in the colour, not in the black and white. Now there's an awful lot of text and an awful lot of symbols there, so let's go through them. So whether you've got the physical or the digital version of the rulebook on the very last page, there is a handy glossary of sorts that explains an awful lot of terms during the games. And the bottom left-hand corner of that is a breakdown of all the symbols you'll see for skills. So let's have a look at that. So the top symbol, it looks like to be a fella doing a little jig. Um, so this skill affects the champion or follower unit using the skill. So it is a self-affecting ability. Looking at Nia's plot card, I can see she's got two of these abilities that affect herself. One called Meditation, one called March. Meditation has a little symbol. I'm not quite sure what that is, but I'm going to assume it's good as it's got a plus symbol. And the other one is March. Move Nia up to one hex. That makes sense. That one I understand. It's a second move ability. Which, given in within the skill section of the rulebook, it states a specific action may only be used once per activation. Having a second way of moving my model around seems very useful indeed. Right then, on to the next symbol. Little coggy fella, gotcha. So this skill affects a friendly champion or follower unit. Now, Nia doesn't have any of these, but the implication here is quite clear. Whilst the first one is a self-affecting spell, the cog symbol means that that spell can be, or skill I should probably say, can be cast on any friendly or champion unit. Got it? Makes sense. Third one then, kind of a star looking thing with a hex in the middle. Uh, this skill affects the model or hexes described in the skill. Oh, okay, that makes sense why it's got a hex in it. It's some kind of pulse effect that affects everyone? So Nia does have one of these on the plot card side of her card, Crystal Mirror. So choose a boon on any model within range, then choose a friendly model within range to gain that boon. Not quite sure what boons are or how I calculate ranges at this point, but it sounds good. That sounds like something that will benefit me. Conversely, on the Clash side of her card, she's got a very similar skill called Crystal Glare. Choose a Blight on any model within range, then choose an enemy model within range to gain that Blight. So, using the power of the mind, I can assume that boons are good things and Blights are bad things. So it looks like in the plot phase, Nia buffs her own models um, by giving them boons. And then in the Clash phase, she debuffs enemy models by giving them Blights. That makes perfect sense. I hope I'm right. Ooh, I bet that's what that little symbol on meditation is. I bet that's one of them there boons. Smashing these out. Right, next symbol, Skull. This skill targets an enemy champion or follower. Let's be honest, this is an attack. That's what that is. That is very clearly an attack. It's got an evil skull. It targets the enemies and it's going to do stuff to them. That is an attack. So Nier has a couple of these attacky looking actions, or skills, I should call them skills because that's what they're called, on her, the Clash card side of her card. So she's got one called Erosion, which has a hit effect of a little black symbol with a negative thing, which I think is a, is a Blight. And then there's another one called Blinding Light, which again has another negative symbol, which I still think are Blights. I reckon I'm right on that. There are then some numbers and symbols. Don't know. But moving on through the rulebook, maybe that'll get explained. Ah, they're being explained now. Look at this. It's all laid out in a logical order. Brilliant. So, that first symbol of a picture of, you know, what looks like an episode of Blockbusters. Uh, so, the maximum number of hexes away a model can be and still be affected by their skill. That's a range. We all know what a range is. We're gamers. That's fine. Although, I suppose it's been explained in words for people that aren't gamers. So, yay, inclusion. 
Next, there's some kind of sniper reticule. Uh, so the number of dice rolled to hit your target. So accuracy. So, all right. Well, I'll have a look back at Nia's skills in a second to give some context. And then lastly, some cross swords. The number of dice rolled to damage your target. Gotcha. That all makes sense. So let's have a look at Nia's skills to give some context. So looking at erosion and blinding light again, we know that the first number is range, so the, according to this, two. The range of this ability is two. It can affect models up to two hexes away. The next, the little accuracy reticule symbol is five, so I'm rolling five dice to see whether or not that hits. Presumably that's some kind of contested roll that I have a number I have to beat. Oh, I assume so. Uh, I'm sure that'll be explained as shortly. And then in the last column for erosion, for the cross swords, which is damage, there's nothing. So this skill does no damage. Right, well, it has a hit effect, so it does the little blight symbol. Not sure what that is, but okay, that's what that skill does. Erosion applies some kind of debuff. Gotcha. Blinding light, let's have a look at that one. Again, two hex range makes sense i'm rolling four dice so not as accurate as erosion but it does have a damage part to it five damage dice that sounds good like the sound of that so it's got a hit effect of applying a blight that i don't know what it does and it does some damage maybe i'm not sure how to do damage yet so that's what those things mean i've just got no idea how to use them brilliant right then this seems a good time to talk about dice i don't know about you but I own a lot of dice. Like, a lot of them. It's a point of contention in my house. I own dice. Um, so I can assume that I'll be using some of the dice I already own with this game? <laughs> no, God Tier has its own dice. I have to buy more dice. <laughs> come to me, little cubes of joy. No, so God Tier has its own dice, which come in both the starter sets and presumably will be available separately. And there were some lovely smoky ones available to the Kickstarter people like me. Hooray, exclusives. So the, the uh, dice for God Tier, as you can see in front of you, have the God Tier symbol on them. Some of them have a blank side. Some of them have one of these symbols and some of them have two of these symbols. So there are two sides which have nothing, three sides which have one symbol and one side which have two symbols. So if you really wanted you could just use standard D6 and say that one and two are no successes, three, four and five are one six, six, success, <laughs> that's a word I can say, and that the six side of your six sided dice are two successes. That makes sense? We've got two, nothing, three, something, one. Hooray! So I know that these are the dice I'm rolling, and in the case of erosion and blinding light, I'm rolling five and four of them respectively. But then what? What am I comparing this number against? Surely I have to get a certain number of successes for the, for the uh, skill to succeed? That makes sense, but what do I do? So every champion or follower model in the game has a dodge value, which is represented by that little arrow swoosh and somebody having a dance, uh, or may dodging, in fact. That's what that is, they're dodging, which is on both the plot card and the clash card. So when using an attack skill, I take my dice up to the value of my accuracy, and then I roll them trying to get more or the same amount of successes as my target's dodge value. Right then, let's do an example. So let's assume it's the clash phase, and our brave heroine Nia is facing off against the orc Blackjaw like some kind of brave heroine. Because, you know, she is, unlike those nimbly bimbly cowardly elves. No one likes an elf. So for the sake of example, let us say that the Nia and Blackjaw players are in adjacent hexes, and that it is the Blackjaw players go in the clash phase. The Blackjaw player elects to use Fiery Axe, which states this skill may target up to three models in one hex. Well, there's only one model in the adjacent hex, and that's Nia, so not relevant here, but good to know, just in case he decides to attack a group of followers in the future. It has a range of one hex, good, Nia's next door, and has an accuracy of four dice. So the Blackjaw player must roll four dice, and aim to either equal or beat the value of the dodge on Nia's card. Now that doesn't sound super likely with the maths on the dice, but hey, for this example, let's say that it worked. Sorry, Nia. Looking back at the Fiery Axe skill, I can see it has a damage of five dice. Okay, so I'm rolling more dice. What am I rolling against this time? So all champions and followers have this 
protection statistic or armor value, whatever you want to call it. They call it protection, I think. I'm going to call it armor, probably. Um, in this case, in Nier, it is two. So the Black Jewel player takes the five dice from their Fiery Axe skill and compares it to the two value of Nier's protection stat. And then... Okay, so this bit might be a little bit fiddly or unfamiliar for people that haven't yet played Steamforge games before. For those of you who've played Guild Ball, this will be very familiar to the playbook net hits mechanic. For everyone else, give me a moment, I'll walk you through it. So what you do is you take the number of successes on your damage roll, minus the protection or armor value of the target you're trying to hit, that's the amount of damage you do. Nice. Got it? So let's say that Blackjaw got five successes. Um, so we take the five minus the two of Nier's armor or protection stat, which leaves us with three damage. So where does that damage go? So every champion has a health value, which is the last statistic. Ah, oh, it's almost like I planned these in a certain order. So in Blackjaw's case, he has eight health. Nier's case, he has six health. Makes sense. He's a big orc. She's not. So when you take damage, you take some of these little heart-shaped tokens that come in the starter sets and place them next to the champion's card to denote that they've taken damage. Or the follower, I guess. Followers might have a lot of health. They don't. But there's those blights and boons symbols again, so there's tokens for those as well. You should probably look at what they do in a minute. Right, that's it. I can't not talk about it anymore. Let's talk about status icons. Let's talk about blights and boons. Those status icons are these little tokens that you can pop on your character card to denote various effects. Not only health, as we've just already talked about, but also blights and boons. Now, eagle-eyed, handy viewers, such as you are, may have already noticed that these symbols bear a striking correlation to the statistics we've already talked about. And this is done on purpose. Yes. So again, if we turn to that last page of the rulebook where everything's kind of laid out as a summary, very conveniently we have the five boon icons and the five blight icons. So essentially going down through the boon, we have a speed buff, a dodge buff, an armor buff, an accuracy buff, and a damage buff. That all makes perfect sense. To go back to Nia's card and have a look at meditation now, Nia's meditation skill only affects her. We know that because we talked about it already, and it gives this accuracy buff boon token so on the next attack skill that she makes she gets to roll an additional dice on her attack makes perfect sense similarly looking at the blight icons going down those five we have a debuff to speed to dodge to armor to accuracy and to damage it's exactly the same things that are affected but whereas boons are a positive on those five statistics blights are a negative on those five statistics so again, using Nier's skills as an example, I can see that if I hit with Erosion, I apply a Blight to that target's armor, and with Blinding Light, a Blight to that target's accuracy. Gotcha. Now one thing that's very important to take away from this, and I really want to highlight, is the use of the word NEXT in every single one of these Blights and Boon tokens. As a result, timing is everything about when you use these debuffs or buffs on your models or the enemy models and as the recipient of them when in turn you take those actions to either clear it so that you're not being massively affected by the blight or in fact don't use the boon at the wrong stage timing as ever in life is key well now that was a lot of information, but hey, skills are a vast majority of what you'll be doing in the game and a very key component of it, so it makes sense to spend a bit of time on it. Right, what's next on our agenda of things that we can do? Wait, why, why is there a Quartzling card on screen? Why are we looking at followers? They're no different to champions. Hey, hang on. Why does Shimmer and Stone's Throw have a whole bunch more numbers? What's this nonsense? Margotson! Turns out, it's very simple. Don't worry. So because multiple followers can occupy the same hex, their abilities are changed depending on how many of their friends they have around them. So let's take Shimmer, for example. It still has a range of two, but whether it has one, two, or three Quartzlings in the same hex will depend on how many dice you roll to apply that, bar that Blight. Equally, on the Clash card side of the card so <laughs> um stone's throw will depend the range remains the same but the number of accuracy and damage dice you roll depends on how many quartzlings are in that hex makes sense lovely 
champion only skills now the ultimate skill use the champion's ultimate skill now you may have heard me already mention before that the ultimate skill is something that is used once per game or can be used once per game but it's not anywhere on any of these plot or clash cards is it now where is it so as well as their plot phase and their clash phase card champions also have an additional card which contains more rules hooray rules so in the case of nia's card it's going to contain three different rules and i'm going to go from the bottom upwards so at the very bottom will be an individual rule to that champion something extra that makes them just that little bit more special and differentiates them from people within their class in the middle there is information on the champion's class in this case Nia is a shaper champion now all of the classes will receive bonus victory points or bonus steps as it's noted there depending on actions that they're taken so they are have a certain affinity each with scoring points in a certain way and i'll come back to that later lastly right at the top is a character's ultimate ability this is a once per game ability that should have a significant impact on the battlefield itself and the use of it and the timing of it will be key to victory so that's everything that's on the champions card but let's say if i've used my ultimate ability neo has fired off her geode in the plot phase because that's the only time you can use this particular one what happens next do i just take a pen and cross it out to remind myself that i've used it no not at all i can just turn it over and there's exactly the same text but without the ultimate ability written on it reminding me that i've already used it love this just such a simple way of making information easy to understand for both me and my opponent love it back to my list of actions that i can take and the next one available to us is the claim action so claim place the champion's banner model in an adjacent empty objective hex so you may remember me talking about these earlier that each champion has their own individual banners there's nears on the left there looking all geody so we can use the claim action to walk up to an objective hex and stick a flag in it Now objective hexes and their locations will depend wholly on your scenario that you're playing and also in some cases on the champions that you're using as some champions can move them around or make their own ones. Nia included, you may have noticed on her ultimate ability. Needless to say, objective hexes play a significant portion of the game even if you've no intention of sticking a flag in them as only champions can walk on them and followers can't. Now why you'd want to walk on them or in fact stick a flag in them, I'll come back to later not earlier that'd be weird now the next two actions on the list of actions that we can take during a phase rally and recruit are champion and follower only and are kind of linked in that they both talk about being knocked out and what you can do about that so let's talk about being knocked out so when a follower or a champion has taken wounds equal to its health it is said to be knocked out now there's a big old chunk of text on exactly what knocked out is and i'll leave that on the screen it explains it very very well so essentially when you are a follower and you take as many health as you can you're gone remove the model from the board it's no longer there that said if you're a champion well champions are slightly hardier things what with being able to obtain all these god tiers and that so they have all status effects or blights and boons removed from them the opponent then gets to move your champion two spaces and it must stay there until it does something about it. What can it do? Well, in the case of the champion, it can take the rally action, in which case it removes all of those health tokens and stands up and gets back into the fight. Uh, conversely, the follower actions, you can use the recruit action to put an additional follower model onto the board next to your champion. And that's essentially it. Now there are both champions and followers that interact with the knocked out rules in slightly different ways. They have special rules that allow them to uh, cheat, <laughs> frankly, but I'll let you find those for yourselves. So there we go, there are all the actions that I can take in a turn explained one by one. Whew, that took a while, but how many of these actions can I take in each turn? Two. You can take two only two <laughs> in each the plot phase and the clash phase each champion and follower may take two actions you can't interrupt it once you start you got to finish and some of them cheat again there are always exceptions in these things right then 
So we've talked about actions you can take, the different phases in which you can take actions. We've talked about using skills and blights and boons and other status effects. How you get knocked out. We've talked about quite a lot. This is turning into quite a long video. Well done for sticking with it. Um, we should probably talk about scoring points. Now in the first 30 seconds of this video I put up a picture of the battleground or the battle map, whatever you want to call it, and I shall do the same again now because it's relevant once more. There it is again in all its suitable glory, so the battle ladder at the side on the left hand side of the screen, there is the thing that I is, is most relevant here, is this is how you can visually interpret how your, your scoring throughout a turn is going, and equally how well your opponent's turn is going. Now I mentioned this earlier, but in an albeit slightly rushed fashion in the introduction to this video, that whoever is going first in a turn places the turn token on the first step of their side of the battle ladder. If you look at the picture on screen, this is explained much better than I can using words, in that it is just peeking over the line into their side. So whoever is going first has a slight advantage when it comes to scoring points or, or moving the steps of the battle ladder, but I'm sure equally there are advantages to going second, namely being able to react to what your opponent is doing, so it'll all balance out, I'm sure. So as you score points, or as they're called in the book, and I should probably start referring to them as, as you start to move steps on the battle ladder, that little token will move closer and closer to your warband token at the end of the battle ladder. Got it? Nice. That's all very well and good, knowing how I mark the scores, but how do I actually score points, or as I should start referring to it, how do I move steps on the battle ladder? Well, fear not, handy viewer, such as you are, here is the answer to your question. Now again, this is all on that last page of the rulebook. Very, very handy little summary there. And these are the battle ladder steps. So, going through them in order. If I knock out an enemy champion, and we've already seen a couple of minutes ago how we do that, I gain four steps on the battle ladder. So I get to move the turn token four steps on that ladder towards my warband token. That's a lot. Ignore the bit in parentheses. I'll come back to that. There is then two that can be sort of grouped together, either knocking out a small enemy follower or a large enemy follower. Um, they are worth one and two steps respectively. It will say on the follower card whether or not it is a large or a small enemy follower. You, you can probably guess the large ones are massive. Uh, so they are worth, like I said, one or two steps respectively. So not as worth as many uh, steps as taking out an enemy champion. But hey, there's a lot more followers so that makes sense, it's a target rich environment, ignore the bit in parenthesis. Um, make a claim action during the plot phase, we know what that is, stick in a flag in something. That's worth one step, ignore the bit in parenthesis. And finally, having a friendly banner on an objective hex during the end phase, that is worth another whopping four steps, ignore the bit in parenthesis. Got it? All makes sense? Right then, the bits in parenthesis. Now you may have noticed eagle-eyed handy viewers, such as you are, that there are a number of bonus points depending on a coloured little symbol to each of these ways of scoring steps. <laughs> I call them steps, not points. Yay me! In each case, they are plus one. In each case, they're kind of grouped together so that you know the the red one with the stabby sword gets an additional step for killing an enemy champion. The swirly one gets an extra step for killing a follower, whether it's large or small. The green hexy one kind of thing looks a bit like a dream catcher, gets one for making claim actions. And the blue one gets an extra point step, step, not points, step, for having that banner still exist at the end of the turn. But what are they and how do I get them? So these four symbols, uh, as you've probably already guessed, correspond to the different champions that you can use in the game. In fact, we've already seen one of these symbols quite a lot in this video on our good friend Nia. There she is again, and you can see in the top right-hand corner there is that same symbol that we've just seen on screen. And in fact, we don't even really need the symbols because... I'll try that again. Because both the colour of the card and also the colour of the model when it comes out of the box corresponds to this class that that champion is. In this case, Nia is a Shaper champion. So each of these four symbols and each of these four colours 
corresponds to a different class. Now, we've had quite a lot of time looking at Shaper Champion in the form of Nia. Equally, you may remember that uh, Blackjaw had a yellow card, and also his model is yellow when it comes out of the box, corresponding to the yellow symbol on the screen, or Maelstrom Champion. So the four classes then, you have Slayers like Sneaky Pete here on screen who specialise in doing large amounts of damage accurately to one target. Equally with Sneaky Pete, you may notice he has an attack action in the plot phase and not just in the clash phase. That's very strong. Um, then you have Maelstrom characters like our old friend Blackjaw here who specialises in taking out large swathes of followers. His attacks may not be as accurate as Sneaky Pete's or do as much damage, but they can do it to large numbers of models. So, and as such, they not only have a, a, a statistical advantage when attacking followers, but as a Maelstrom character, they'll earn bonus steps for taking out enemy followers. We then have Shaper Champions, like we've already seen with Nier, but we also have now Wraith Marid on screen. They specialise in controlling the board, in mobility, moving objective hexes around, and getting an additional step for claiming with those flags in the plot phase. And lastly, we have the big old boy himself, Rodri, the world's biggest dwarf. He is a Guardian Champion. They specialise in stalwart action, being stoic, and also causing your opponent's actions to be inefficient and require a bit more resources than normal. As such, if they have their banner in the ground in the end phase on an objective hex, they score additional steps for doing so. So that's the four, ch the four classes of champion. And that, essentially, is god tier. Those are the core mechanics, those are the principal ways in which we play, and those are all the little symbols and numbers on the cards explained. Hopefully it's made sense, and hopefully it's given you an opportunity to think a little bit more about the game and whether or not you'd like to play it. There are a number of God Tier podcasts cropping up, one of which to mention I think straight away is the Phenomenal Blights and Boons by Andrew from Singled Out. Now if you've been part of the Guild Ball community you'll be familiar with Singled Out, but Blights and Boons with Andrew and Dan have been going the whole way through the Kickstarter and playtest process and are not only a nice insight into people that have played an awful lot of the game, but also may show you a little bit how the game has changed throughout the playtesting process. And as somebody that was involved in that, I can say that most certainly it has. And always for the better. So yes, go and have a listen to Blights and Boons. Say hello, Andrew. Hello. There's also the fantastically named Pod Tier, who have just put out an episode today as I record this, interviewing lead developer Steve Margitson. So do go and have a listen to that. Pod Tier is presented by those lovely chaps over at The Rookie. Say hello, Matthew. Hello! <laughs> Solid Connor channeling. There's also those chaps from the Midlands, Glory Goals, who produce a just a cornucopia of content and events and have a live weekly Twitch from Grange Gaming, I think, and just constant content production. So if they get their hands into, into God tier as well, as certainly they're intending on doing, you can expect a huge amount from them. Say hello, Luke. Hello. Oh, saucy. If the written word is more your thing, and fair enough, you can, you can look at it at work that way, um, then have a look at fishywargaming.com. Dan Down there has long been a producer of blogs for Steamforge content, and they cover a great deal of other games as well. Say hello, Dan. Oh, wait, yeah, you're a blog. Yeah, no, no audio content. Gotcha. My bad. Lastly, there is some great video content produced by Steamforge themselves over on their YouTube channel where you can go and see where I stole my introduction from and also watch Jamie and Steve talk about the distinct phases of the game in much, much quicker time than I. I'm intending on doing my own battle reports as I did for Gilball with Don't Touch the Beard with my, what the Patreons named Godbeard. You can probably see a little thing on for screen for it now. Um, I'm sure content will be cropping up all over the place. And if you find anything, please do leave a comment down in the doobly-doo, letting people know where it is. So handy viewers, such as you are, I do hope you've enjoyed this little foray into the world of God Tier. Hopefully it's a game you will give a chance. Speak to your local pundits and grab a demo. Or just anyone you see playing the game, have a little look. And until next time, as ever... I need a better outro.